Hello, third graders. I'd like to read a story that connects with our poetry. We're ending the year with a unit on poetry and connecting to our small moment writing and around language, um, and also continuing our look through R&I at the voices of independence and uh, those who struggled to and still struggle today to uh, feel like they have the same equality rights um, and this story I think is a really wonderful story that brings a lot of those ideas together. It's called The Remarkable Story of George Moses Horton, Poet. And uh, this is historical fiction. So this is a real person, uh, but the author has had to fictionalize certain things. But we're learning about um, someone who did exist and really uh, what became a, a wonderful poet. I just wanna show you the author. So uh, in case you, you may be familiar or not. So um, Don Tate, and it says here, Don Tate is the author and illustrator of numerous critically acclaimed books for children, including The Amazing Age of John Roy Lynch, The Cart That Carried Martin, and Hope's Gift. So if you like this story, look some of those up. He won an Ezra Jack Keats New Writer honor for his first picture book text. It just happened when Bill Trailer started to draw and an Ezra Jack Keats Book Award for Poet, The Remarkable Story of George Moses Horton. So this has won an award. Oop, there we go. An award for um, this story. So I feel like I'm having one of those things where it's not aligned. I wonder if my, I'm just going to check, hold on everybody, what my Wi-Fi is. All right, well, hopefully it'll catch up. The Remarkable Story of George Moses Horton, Poet. Let's see if I can get, okay. George loved words. He wanted to learn how to read, but George was enslaved he and his family lived on a farm in Chatham County, North Carolina, where they were forced to work long hours. There wasn't time for much else. Besides, George knew his master would not approve of his slaves reading. But that didn't stop George from admiring the language that was all around him. Inspirational words read from the Bible, hopeful words delivered in a sermon, lively words sung in songs. We say, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. So he may not be able to read and write, but he can certainly enjoy the language that he hears around him. George was determined to learn how to read. When white children studied their books, he lingered nearby. He listened as they repeated the letters of the alphabet. Soon, George could recite the alphabet himself. His mother would have liked to help him, but she couldn't. Instead, she gave George one of her most valuable possessions, a Wesley hymnal, a book of songs. It was George's very first book. He scanned the pages, trying to make out the letters. It was no use, though. He could not read the words. Then, George found an old spelling book. It was tattered and some pages were missing, but it was enough to get him started. George thumbed through its pages. He recognized some of the letters. At night, when he should have been resting after a long day of work, George studied by firelight. His eyes burned from the smoke. Soon he could make out the words. I'm sorry, soon he could make out a few words. Before long, he could understand entire sentences. Over time, George taught himself to read. I talked last week, I think in a flip grid about determination and a time that you really had to keep trying and keep trying. This is what he's doing. George is not giving up. From that point forward, George not only loved words, he could read and understand them too. George read verses from the New Testament. He read books, newspaper articles, advertisements, whatever he could find. Most of all, George read poems. 
he loved beautiful poetry. Rise up, my soul, and let us go up to the gospel feast. From early morning until late at night, George tended cattle on his master's farm. While he worked, George composed his own poetry, mingling his words with the tunes of familiar songs. He hadn't learned how to write his poems down yet, so he committed them to memory. Words and rhythms were stored up inside his head. Remember, we talked also this year about the importance of the oral tradition, the spoken tradition of poetry, song, indigenous stories. So keeping it in your head, that's another way to save your stories and your poetry. His verses swayed with emotion like the music of Sunday services. They kept him strong as he grew to be a young man. When George was 17, his master decided to split up his estate. He divided his possessions, land, cattle, wagons, tools among his family. Slaves were considered to be property too, so George's family was separated. George was given to his master's son. He feared he would never see his mother, brothers, and sisters again. George toiled in the fields on his new master's property. It was disagreeable work, but he found a little relief on Sundays. On that day, George walked eight miles to the village of Chapel Hill, to the campus of the University of North Carolina. There, he sold fruit and vegetables grown on his master's farm. He didn't mind the long walk, though. George welcomed the opportunity to get away. At first, the college students teased George. To distract himself from their insults, George recited his poetry. Words sweet as the fruit piled high in his cart sprung from his lips. Ooh. I think that's a metaphor in talking about ways to make our writing more interesting. Words, sweet as the fruit piled high in his cart. He's comparing words to sweet fruit because words can be like sweet fruit because they can be so pleasant to, to, sat, to listen to, so interesting um, to, in the way that they create uh, pictures in our minds. Hmm. Every eye grew wide and every mouth fell open at the sound of George's voice uttering beautiful verses. The students were awestruck when they found out that he had composed them himself. So all you need to do to make them impressed, realize that he had a lot more than what they were just assuming. Now they're impressed. News of the slave poet raced through campus like a brisk flowing river. Ah, simile. So the news is compared to a brisk flowing river. So shh, traveling really fast. Students swarmed in close to hear George perform his verses. Some of them decided to help George. They gave him their books, English grammar and dictionaries, history and oratory, classic literature and poetry. George soaked up these new subjects like a sponge. Ah, another simile. He's like a sponge taking in everything he possibly can read and getting it into his brain to help him continue to write his own poetry. One day, a student requested a poem for his sweetheart. George created a verse for the woman. He dictated the poem to the student who wrote it out neatly. The young lady swooned when she read it. After that, other students wanted George's poems, and they were willing to pay for them, too. <gasps> He's earning some money for his poetry. George composed more than a dozen love poems a week, selling them for 25 cents each. Some paid him with fine suits and shoes instead of money. In time, George dressed as sharply as the students themselves. With money, nice clothes, and newfound status, 
George felt freer than he ever had in all of his life. But he was not free. He remained the property of his master. George continued to work on the farm during the week and visit Chapel Hill on the weekends. The story of the slave poet reached the wife of a professor. Caroline Lee Hentz was a professional writer and published poet. George's poems affected her deeply. Some made her smile, while others made her cry. She sought out George and taught him how to write his poems on paper with a pen. After so many years of memorizing verses, George could now write them down. So all those years, he'd been just keeping everything in his head. Caroline arranged for George's poems to be printed in the Gazette, the newspaper of her hometown, Lancaster, Massachusetts. Ah, in this state. Uh, Lancaster is in the, I think it's in the farther western part of the state. Uh, I'd have to double check that. Now George was a published poet. His poems protested his enslavement. No other American slave had done that before. Now remember Phyllis Wheatley, who was earlier than George. George is living in the 1800s. Phyllis Wheatley, who we had read a bit about, she was the first um, female poet in uh, America in the 1700s, 1775, thereabouts, around the time of the revolution. Um, she was writing about uh, enslavement, but not in the same way as, as it protesting. She had a little bit of a quieter approach to it. And this was also, it would have been 50 years earlier um, than he's writing. So, um, and she was eventually uh, released. She was given her freedom by the, the Wheatley family. But, and her poems were published first in, in England, in Britain, and then eventually published here. So, th but he, he has, this is the first where it's a direct protest, a very clear protest. Soon George's work appeared in other newspapers, including Freedom's Journal, the first African-American owned newspaper in the country. George's heart could barely contain his growing pride. With money from his writing and odd jobs, George was able to pay his master for his time so that he could live in Chapel Hill and work as a poet. It was an illegal arrangement, but his master didn't care. So basically George is saying, I'm just giving you the money. You can hire someone else or whatever. I'm not doing the work. I need to do my work, which is writing. And, I ha and he has money now from his writing. So he's basically paying. So he's still enslaved, but he's getting out of having to do those jobs by giving his uh, master money for it. And I guess that was illegal, but it sounds like his master's just like, whatever, I'll take the money. Um, so George was now a full-time writer, but he was still not a free man. Because if he was a free man, he wouldn't have to be paying uh, his master anything. So he's losing money. Um, because he's still enslaved. In time, George published The Hope of Liberty, his first book. He wanted to use his earnings to purchase his freedom. So you could buy your freedom at a certain point if you could save up. When editors at Freedom's Journal learned of his plan, they tried to raise money to help him. Influential people joined the cause, newspapermen, a college president, a governor, they offered a great deal of money, but George's master refused to sell his valuable slave because he is making money now off of George. George was devastated. These are some of the, uh, his writings coming from his head. When first my bosom glowed with hope, I gazed as from a mountain top on some delightful plain, but oh, how transient was the scene. It fled as though it had not been, and all my hopes were vain. So that's, he's expressing how sad, how devastated he is. He had, everybody's trying to help, not everybody, but people are trying to help. He's got the money and he's still 
being denied his freedom. Meanwhile, abolitionists in the North worked to end slavery. They published books, they printed posters and pamphlets, they blanketed the South with their calls for enslaved people to rise up against their masters. Slaves who could read told others their message. As a result, more slaves did fight back and some even killed their masters. Fear ruled the South. New laws were passed in North Carolina. People who printed and distributed anti-slavery materials were penalized. That means punished. Worse yet, it became illegal to teach a slave how to read or write. Out of fear, this is what the whites were doing, putting, passing laws that were really keeping down any of the protests. So now it was too dangerous for George to write poems that protested slavery. But he didn't stop writing altogether. He published his second book, The Poetical Works of George M. Horton, which contained poems about life, love, death, and friendship. In 1861, war broke out between the North and South, mainly over the issue of slavery. So this is what we call the Civil War, which we'll learn more about uh, in older upper grades. Um, and it's not just about slavery, it's a very complicated, uh, but it's about the economics. Um, the economics of, of enslaving people. Our country was basically built on slavery. So it became a huge um, money making operation. So uh, that's why in the South, we have the large plantations. They were unwilling to end slavery because they would all have lost their business, their income, their livelihood. So it's very complicated. You will learn more about that as you um, get older. But uh, most of the students went off to fight to defend the South. So, the, so this, during the Civil War, people, uh, a lot of lives were lost, North and South. Civil means um, it's a war within your own country. Um, even though the word civil is sort of strange. Hmm. I always think of when you're, when you're civil, you're being polite. That's often how the word is used, to be civil, but this was not civil. But civil really has to do with civilization. So if you think about the roots of it, Latin or Greek, uh, look that up. So civil has to do with the, probably the, the life, human interaction, civilization. Okay. With few people left on campus to purchase his poems, George had no way to earn money to pay for his time away from his master. He had to return to the farm. Am I sadly cast aside on misfortune's rugged tide? Will the world my pains deride forever? The Civil War raged on for four long years. In 1863, President Abraham Lincoln set the nation on a new course by signing the Emancipation Proclamation. That soon led to the end of slavery. At the age of 66, George was finally free. Now that he was a free man, George no longer had to remain on the farm. Later that spring, he packed his pens and paper and left. George went west with the Union Army camping along the way. He wrote poems about his travels about his family and friends back home, and about all the things he had experienced in his long life. George's love of words had taken him on a great journey. Words made him strong. Words allowed him to dream. Words loosened the chains of bondage long before his last day as a slave. I'll love thee as long as I live. Whatever thy condition may be, all else but my life would I give, that thou wast as partial to me. And then this is all the research that our, the author did. Uh, look, clearly read um, uh, George Horton 
uh, sorry, George Moses Horton, there we go, George Moses Horton's poetry and books, uh, and looked at other works. These are the quotations that he chose to use. And then there's a long author's note about why um, he wrote this. And I think this is nice. I'm going to read it. Uh, he says, when I first began illustrating children's books, I decided that I would not work on stories about slavery. So he's African American. And he said he didn't want to write about slavery. You know, it's a hard topic, hard history, I call that, hard to talk about. I had many reasons, one being that I wanted to focus on contemporary stories, right? Modern times. Why do we always have to go back into our history? Uh, contemporary stories relevant to young readers today. In all honesty, though, what I wasn't admitting to myself was that I was ashamed of the topic. Right? It's hard to talk about people enslaving others, or if you're the one who's been enslaved or your ancestors have been. I grew up in a small town in the Midwest in the 1970s and 80s. At school, I was usually the only brown face in a sea of white. I feel like as I read this, I should be able to have you see who we're, who's talking here. There we go. A sea of white. Uh, let's see. It seemed to me that whenever the topic of black history came up, it was always in relation to slavery about how black people were once the property of white people, no more human than a horse or a wheelbarrow. Sometimes white kids snickered and made jokes about the topic. Sometimes black kids did too. Just got a point. You know, we, we talk about uh, enslavement, slavery in third grade because so much of our R&I studies has to do with colonization of Europe. Europeans coming over and enslaving the indigenous people who were living here, but also bringing people here um, against their will. And it is not the only topic we would like to be talking about. Um, so he's got a great point. As my career progressed, more manuscripts on the topic of slavery were offered to me. At first I hesitated. But as I read the stories and studied the history of my people, I had a change of heart. I decided that there was nothing to be ashamed of and much to feel proud about. I fell in love with stories that demonstrated the resilience of Ameri African American people. And although the publishing industry could do a better job of balancing the topic of slavery with other African American stories, tales of enslaved people deserve to be told. Right? Hard history, but deserve to be told because you're absolutely right. If we don't talk about George Moses Horton, incredible poet, and his story isn't told, we might, we might just imagine in our minds what, what it means to be um, enslaved. And every person's story is going to be different. Every individual has their own story. Whether it's today, contemporary, like your small moment journal writing, you're, you're writing about something that happened to you, your story, your experience. And that's what makes it unique. So he goes on to say, I was especially intrigued when an author friend suggested I write about George M Moses Horton. For research, I relied heavily on Horton's autobiography, The Life of the Author, written by himself. It's a short, inspiring narrative outlining the major events of his life, but it raised many questions that nagged at me. George Moses Horton taught himself to read, sold poetry to college students, and published several books, all at a time when African American literacy was discouraged, devalued, even outlawed in this country. How was he able to accomplish so much? To better understand what Horton achieved, I needed to study the unique characteristics of slavery in North Carolina. I learned that things were somewhat different there than they were elsewhere in the South. That's another thing to keep in mind. To, slavery could look different depending on where you were. In, in Massachusetts, there aren't 
or in all of the North, there aren't the large plantations, but there was still slavery. But it may look different, still not an okay um, situation, but we, we have to be careful to look at individual stories and not lump everything together. So this, he's doing his research, he's thinking, this story seems, you know, he did a lot, what was going on in North Carolina? So it says here, he learned North Carolina was home to one of the largest free black populations in all of the colonies. More free African Americans than in any other colony at that time or state. Many North Carolinians supported anti-slavery organizations and the emancipation of slaves. Plantations were smaller, requiring fewer laborers, and often less affluent farmers worked their land alongside their slaves. So that means you'd have people more mixing of white and people of color. In fact, as peculiar as this may sound, slaves were sometimes considered family members. No doubt Horton benefited from this more open-minded atmosphere. Life for an enslaved person was still not easy in North Carolina. Slaves performed day-long, back-breaking work for no pay. Their diet, provided by their owners, was typically poor and their clothing inadequate. Families could be torn apart and sold away at any time, never to see each other again, as happened to George. In the face of these adversities, Horton's achievements were monumental. In 1831, about 55 whites were killed in a slave rebellion in nearby Virginia and attitudes changed in North Carolina. So that was what he was uh, sh sharing here when suddenly they cracked down and got really tough with their laws because there was a rebellion, a slave rebellion. Uh, angry people that were saying this is wrong and they, um, they fought. But so that changed things. So literate slaves who could read about abolitionist activities and inform others were now a threat. They were seen as a threat, right? When you speak out, uh, that sometimes others feel threatened by that. North Carolina passed laws that forbade anyone, white or black, from teaching an enslaved person to read or write. Whites could be fined for breaking the law. A person of color, slave or free, could be whipped up to 39 lashes. Needless to say, it was a dangerous time for Horton, whose poems often protested slavery. He continued to write and even published a second book, The Poetical Works of George Moses Horton, but he avoided the topic of slavery or his hope for freedom. Following the end of the Civil War, Horton gained his freedom. In 1865, he published Naked Genius, a third book of poems. In his final years, he moved to Philadelphia, where he wrote short narratives based upon Bible stories, selling them to magazines and Sunday school periodicals. He died in approximately 1883, though the exact date is not known. Nor do we know what he looked like, though you can find photographs on the internet that claim to depict Horton. There are no known images of the poet. In creating this book, it was my goal to present the topic of slavery as more than just an uncomfortable word. I wanted readers to know who George Moses Horton was and to demonstrate his relevance to their lives today. In Horton's day, African-American literacy was unusual, even outlawed. Today, of course, rates are much higher. Still, statistics show that far too many African-American students graduate from high school functionally illiterate, meaning that they cannot read or write. In many ways, literacy is as much of an issue today as it was in Horton's day. I hope that young readers will see themselves in the story of George Moses Horton, a person with talents and hopes and dreams and a desire to be free just like them. Okay, I think this is one of the best author's notes ever. And I hope you stayed to listen to it. And if you enjoyed this story, uh, you can look for Don Tate 
uh, and, and find his other books. All right, everyone. Have a great day. Up to stop the recording. Bye.